everybody welcome to week 197 and i did listen to last week's while i was in kansas and adam come on like yeah that's a lot of them come on man you got to keep up <laughs> you don't get a pass you you you're you're a numbers guy and you should you should be knowing this it's 197 so we got a special week today for you guys please be very kind to our guest Michelle Peltz, she is going to go deep on the whole thing of uh, com commercial real estate leases and the gotcha stuff that's in those things, which is why we need somebody like Michelle to help protect us before we put ink on the paper and sign the dotted line. And then all of a sudden we're in trouble. Uh, it is a very fearful thing <laughs> if you've ever signed a lease or a, a purchase on a commercial property. Both of those are kind of daunting. So anyway, we will go, uh, you know, in depth on that. So we've got good folks on here already. You know the drill. If you don't, here's the deal. You can harass us on the chat. Go easy on Michelle. You can harass Adam, Jack, and myself because we deserve it. Michelle does not. We want her to come back. Uh, if you have questions, hit us up in the Q&A and I will be monitoring those. We got a lot of stuff to talk about too, kind of on the front end because there's some brouhaha coming down on the whole Corporate Transparency Act, et cetera. So um, I guess I'm going to kick it over to Adam first and then to Jack. Jack will um, expand on, on that a little bit more too. And then we'll go into our topic of the day, which is leases and what's lurking in that lease. All right. Cool. Adam. I appreciate it, Gary. Um, so, you know, since I do need occasionally for people to follow me in the bathroom to make sure that I do it correctly, um, <laughs> you know, next time you leave town, just, you know, shoot me a chat saying this is the episode number we're on. Don't screw that up again this time, Bozeman. <laughs> and uh, I'll get you covered. But anyway, um, yeah, you guys can't see Michelle, but she looks horrified right now in terms of like, <laughs> what did I actually agree to with, with these guys? <laughs> like, <laughs> like did i just get zoom bombed like <laughs> what happened here um thanks for being on michelle we really appreciate it uh and i i promise i go into shut up mode here in a second but um you know so not jack's gonna take care of my tirade for me um but related to the cta but yet unrelated um i had the opportunity to meet up with and i'm not advocating this position by the way i just thought it was interesting from somebody on the inside um so I had I, I met up with my favorite libertarian um, last night, Dave Gilroy, um, which you got if you guys are from Charlotte, you know, a lot of you guys know him. Um, but, uh, it, you know, he's an investment banker, um, fractional CFO, but then also side job was that was a cor longstanding Cornelius town commissioner. And he asked me the and he asked me the question, you know. Have you bought any Bitcoin? <laughs> Which, you know, is an unusual question from Dave because he's kind of, you know, what I would put in non-conspiratorial. <laughs> Cam, no offense to anybody that buy Bitcoin or has exposure to Bitcoin. But, and I said, no, you know, like that's not, you know, got some clients to do it. Not my thing. He's like, yeah. He's like, the more that I studied it, the more that, you know, and being in government, you know, because in the middle of government as a libertarian, he's like, I've just realized, and, and remember, Cornelius is a heavily Republican area. Yeah. Um, like, I don't think there may not even be a Democrat on the town board, even though it's a nonpartisan race. He's like, you know, we just have no ability to control ourselves. Like, we can't not spend money <laughs> and we can't not spend more than we take in. Like, it's just impossible. Like, the more that I watch, it doesn't matter. It's like, so it's like, this whole thing is just going to come crashing down at some point. So that's why I got into Bitcoin. I'm like, it's very interesting coming from you. Um, I might consider yeah, <laughs> some now, of this. Now, I'm, yeah, now, now I'm like, I'm actually going to have to go from underneath the mattress, which is because I told them like my real problem with it is that with everything in general is like, I'm still just mad that the price to earnings ratios are too high. So like out of spite, I'm not earning money. <laughs> it's just too overvalued i'll show them not invest um which is kind of my big point philosophy i guess too but i just thought that that was an interesting take in terms of like you know it doesn't matter who it is we just can't not spend money <laughs> you know 
And I think that that's just, you know, it, it's just something to consider because as, it, you know, as we said and been harping on for a while, you know, the, the tax cuts and jobs act is it, which is the current tax regime that we're, that we're under is set to expire um, coming up uh, soon uh, 2026. So it'll be, you know, post-election, you know, depending on the election, maybe it'll get made permanent. It does not solve the spending problem. <laughs> so um, anyway, so just, uh, it's a long way of saying that, hey, just further confirmation from an inside source in government that at some point uh, the house cards got to change and tax rates got to go up since spending probably will not um, come down in any sort of material format straight from the libertarian town board members uh, mouth. And now that I'm Debbie Downer, Jack, what you got for us this week? <laughs> the Bitcoin is at 67,000 bucks today. Yeah, so I, know, you... I know. Yeah. yeah. Dang. Yeah. <laughs> Looney, Looney Tunes. Yeah. Looney Tunes. It's crazy. Yeah. So, so you're not a, a fan of Bitcoin or because I'm on the precipice of thinking about it. Because I'm just, you know, but I don't understand it enough to do something about it. So yeah, that, that's my whole that's my whole problem too. Is I just, you know, any anything that anything that I can't explain, I can't do anything with. Yeah. <laughs> so I understand it. And, and at the same point, time, that's that, it. <laughs> yeah, and, and at the same time, the, the other problem with that is that it it at my age, I'm also reluctant to learn anything. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> like. Eh. I don't know if I want to know anything new, you know, at this yeah. point, <laughs> I'm just going to ride this baby. You know, my wife gives me all sorts of those Alzheimer's studies. So I'm like, oh, nah. oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's like, please do the shorts puzzle. I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> what did you just ask me? <laughs> yeah, exactly. What, who am I? Yeah. So. <laughs> All right. So um, the, the big news on the Corporate Transparency Act is not as big news as I think everybody thinks it is uh, because ah. it's it's limited. Um, it doesn't apply across the country. Um, so it's limited where the action happened and it's limited to the actual plaintiffs in the case. So let me explain a little further. So 53-page um, opinion released late on Friday afternoon. Uh, the National Small, Small Business Association is the plaintiff, obviously suing the government. Um, the, the business organization contended that the CTA unfairly burdened small businesses by requiring them to divulge highly personal details to FinCEN, which is the federal authority, and that it's, it could cost an average business about $8,000 um, and costs just to, you know, you think it's something simple, submit a name, but I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that go with it. So more of the details. So um, what the, the the district court, and this is federal court, found that um, the CTA is not within um, Congress's powers to oversee foreign policy. So what the government, the feds had done, it said, well, wait a minute, we have foreign um, policy and regulatory and security powers within the constitution and so the um the court said no uh you do not have that authority under your foreign affair powers um congress is bound by the constitution's enumerated powers limitation because these kind of things are left to the states the individual states to um govern so basically they're saying that the feds don't have the authority to issue this promulgation to every business in the United States. Um, they also said it's not within the necessary and proper clause to carry out uh, Congress's powers um, to uh, and, and use that to allegedly um, uh, facilitate the finding out or the, the re uh, revealing of illicit and illegal activity. And then this one I don't quite understand because, you know, the, the Federal Commerce Clause is meant to regulate interstate commerce kind of thing. Um, but it says uh, that the government claimed the Commerce Clause gave Congress the power to enact the CTA um, because it, it regulates interstate commerce, not just international commerce. Uh, and then they basically said no. What was interesting is that the court stated in its opinion that Congress could have easily written the CTA to pass muster 
by imposing the disclosure requirements on state entities as soon as they engaged in commerce or from prohibiting the use of interstate commerce to launder money, finance terrorism, or evade taxes. So basically the court is saying, hey, you guys screwed up in the language of the the law, and if you, you jump the gun, you can't impose this regulation and say, um, you know, that just impose it on everyone. You have to basically prove that there's interstate commerce going on. I mean, I would think that just, okay, well, this company has a website. Boom, you're done, right? So I don't necessarily understand that. I mean, I'm very, I'm a proponent that this is being held up, right? Um, and then they also said it was under the taxation powers of Congress to be able to um, uh, look at beneficial ownership to protect the um, integrity of our financial system and taxation and everything else. So the, the lower court didn't buy any of that at all. Uh, and so here, here's what the next steps are. The um, Treasury Department, now they have to um, basically go and appeal it. And if they appeal it, they can ask for the stay to be removed. In other words, that you still have to proceed moving forward with the reporting requirements that you know, we're counting down the clock or, uh, you know, I, I form, I think I told you guys before, I form some entities first week of January. So the, that 90 day clock is ticking. Um, it, it, if it, if the stay is not lifted, then the treasury would also ask the higher court. It's the 11th circuit court of appeals to, um, lift that stay so that there has to be compliance with that. So we just don't know yet. Um, and what is interesting, though, is that, you know, I think a lot in this, the initial knee jerk reaction was for all of us and small businesses say, yeah, we stuck it to them. Right. Hallelujah. Um, but the reality is, is that the because the, this is limited to the plaintiffs and the plaintiffs in this matter are the um the individuals or the businesses that are within this organization that were that were the plaintiffs um and that is just statistically because you know i'm all about statistics 0.1 percent to 0.2 percent of of the over 30 million firms that are required to file these reports in 2024 um and so you know that just really limits uh it's it's 65 thousand businesses, individuals, businesses that really this impacts. So now it would take additional action for it to be imposed um, in other federal districts. So, you know, we're in the district of, of, in the Western District of North Carolina, we're in the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. So there would have to be, you know, that would have to go through the court system here. So, um, you know, good news, I think, in, in moving in the right direction, but this doesn't get us out of jail or the requirements to do what we're supposed to do. Now, again, remember, if you're a business that was formed prior to January 1, 24, you have until the end of the year to provide this report. If you formed a new entity in 2024, then um, you have 90 days from the date of formation to make these reports. Um, we've also talked about where, unfortunately, um, the buck stops here, meaning with Shoemaker. Um, you know, BGW has made it very clear that they're not going to touch this radioactive material and a lot of other uh, CPA firms, some law firms have said we're not doing it. We had to make a decision um, to, to help with businesses do with the compliance. So that's kind of where we're at. But um, so um, a small win, but the, the war still rages on essentially. So that's a summary. That's a really good summary. And you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, or it could be your typical attorney response of it depends. <laughs> That's a technical term, I think, that you learn in law school. But <clears throat> I didn't go to law school. So um, if somebody is like a single member LLC, pretty simple, but still the same requirements that they've got to do, What's the kind of range that somebody's, if they're going to say, hey, I need you to help me do this, are we talking about 500 bucks? Are we talking about 2,000 bucks? Are we talking, like, can you give us a range or is it just a, depends? So for me personally, if that were the situation, I would offer the services and, you know, it, it's probably maybe 
$500 or so for the simplest of things. But I mean, it's, we're still kind of figuring that out because yeah. um, I think a lot of times I would probably suggest that maybe that person go and does it themselves because it's not that difficult to do. When you yeah. get it, you, the, the issues come when you get into more complicated multi-units, multi-owners, maybe you have a trust that's involved. Um, you know, so where, who reports what and when? Uh, so we're, we're yeah, still trying makes... to still figure that out. But I think that, you know, I, you guys know me, I, I'm, if I can direct you to doing something, then I would rather you use the, the, you know, like the USPTO database to see if the name that you want is available rather than us charging you a ton of money for doing that. So, um, yeah, it really doesn't take that long. I'm going to get my FinCEN number. My paralegals are going to get their FinCEN numbers. And so, um, you know, I, I would say that you could, this is probably a, a, a DYI kind of thing for many small businesses that it's maybe one owner, two owners. Yeah. But All right. Cool. You didn't hear that from me. No, I, we've got a, a mutual friend that they've got a small single truck trucking company and it was just another one that are like, Oh man, you know? Uh, so uh, Robert Mayetta says he filed his FinCEN report for his LLC. It took him 10 minutes. Well, that's because it's you, Robert, because you're really good. <laughs> you know, like you're you're smarter than the average bear. Um, hey, Michelle, before we dive into this, I want to make sure that you're aware of this question that came in from Greg. And, and so if you would just address that at some point, that'd be great. But uh, Jack, since she's your partner, would you introduce Michelle for us? So Michelle is, um, you know, I may be divine intervention in that, um, you know, we really just have seen a, a spike in, in commercial real estate transactions, both on the leasing side and on the, the purchase and sale side of things. And we have capacity here, but it, it just the, the increase in capacity or in the needed increase in capacity. And so um, was able to convince her to um, leave a, uh, institutional company and come back into private practice and join us. And, um, she hasn't left. Um, and I haven't seen steam coming <laughs> out of her head and, you know, is, is comes into my office smiling. And I, I met her daughter the other day who was, um, I guess it was uh, take your daughter to work day, which was, um, in, cool. uh, you know, beautiful, um, a young girl. So, um, but yeah, so she and, and uh, Michelle also has um, banking expertise, which is a bonus because we represent banks and then also assist clients with uh, reviewing um, loan documents and things like that. So, um, but, uh, you know, it's it's been one of those things where I've just said, okay, here you go, run with it. And, you know, that takes a very trusting relationship on the front end. So I'm, I'm very um, thankful um, as I said, jokingly to you guys previously that um, she's not from around, around here. So when you hear her talk, you might, you're going to hear her, her Long Island accent come out. All right. Which I appreciate because I was born in Queens. So I get it. Um, so uh, anyway, so Michelle, it's all you. Well, thank you for the introduction, Jack. I have to say up front, I don't have the personality that you gentlemen have. Um <laughs> A it's dry. a good thing, Michelle. I'm, I'm a little drier sometimes. Um, but I do have a t-shirt that says it depends that someone bought me as a joke because I do say it probably more frequently than I think I do. Um, so yeah, it is a hazard of being an attorney. That's funny. Um, I'm going to start off just by addressing Greg's question with the right of first refusal and get that out of the way. Um, so, and Jack, if you have other experiences and you want to chime in, please do. Um, when you are renting a property and you have a right of first refusal, right of first refusal, we refer to as a rofer built into your lease. It's fairly, I'm going to say simple because for, from our perspective, it is property gets listed. You get notified. There's usually a closeout date or time where the listing will come down. Brokers will pull the offer that they want to accept. They'll present that to the tenant and say, hey, we have an offer for $2 million to purchase this property. Do you want to purchase for the same? And it's the same terms. So the terms have to match the offer that they would otherwise accept. So there's no bidding war. It doesn't go back and forth. You are notified based on your ROFR that the property will be listed. And, and it's just based on that. So it's, like I said, fairly simple 
in that respect. And then you have the right of accepting the terms as they're presented or not. You move on. That's helpful. No bidding war. That's great. There's no bidding war. The bidding war happens before the offer is presented over to you. And um, I want to throw one quick thing into you yeah. that happened a, a couple of years ago. So the client in the lease had the right of first refusal or had the, actually it was an option to purchase um, the, the premises and the, the challenge was, and, and I really hadn't thought about this until after this happened or when it happened, is that the terms and the fundamental terms and conditions of the purchase were not um, put into the lease. So it wasn't, okay, this would be the purchase price. This is when the closing would be. So, you know, it, it was suggested that maybe a, a purchase agreement or a form purchase agreement should have been attached to that. We didn't draft it. Initially, we inherited the issue. And um, several years later, many tens of thousands of dollars um, invested by our client in order to make a judge or to, to have a judge tell the landlord, now seller, that he must sell the property. And so um, the, the details were a little more um, you know, intense in that it was, there had to be a con a condominium regime set up and it wasn't set up that way. And so things like that, but just, just be aware of, you know, when we're talking about, you know, um, rights of first refusal and those kind of things, just if there's something that's going to happen after the fact, just kind of think about what do I want that to look like as far as the purchase goes with lease renewals? What do you want the, the, the lease renewal the, you know, how much money you're going to pay, the length of it, and those kind of things. So anyway, just interjecting that because it happened not too long ago. Oh, thank you for that additional information, Jack, because that does happen. And this is why it's important to negotiate your lease as tight as possible early on so that you are aware and you know going into leasing your property what you want. And Greg, you had a follow-up question, what stops the bidder from increasing his bid? So that's, you, that's where the brokers come in and you want to... Hopefully everybody has solid brokers and they know what they're doing on their end and they're commercial brokers. Sometimes residential brokers like to step over and they don't have the experience, but there should be a closeout time before um, there should be a closeout time that the bidding stops. So all offers will be accepted up until 6 p.m. on Thursday, March 7th. And at 6 p.m., the final offer is in. We know what the terms are. And those are the terms and they can't be negotiated past that. And that's what's presented. And we're actually, I'm actually dealing with one right now where there was a right of first refusal and we ended up having it, um, they rejected the property and it is going to the highest bidder when the property was open for, for the bids. So it does happen both in both directions. Sometimes they, sometimes the tenant wants it and sometimes they're like, no. Um, but now it comes down to negotiating your lease and the different types of commercial leases. Um, but what we're seeing most frequently, especially in this in our region, are triple net leases. They are phenomenal for the landlord, and they can be very good for the tenant as well. But they're also very intimidating when you read them because they are long and have a lot of words. So. <laughs> <laughs> gobbledygook <laughs> there's a lot of gobbledygook in those things so a lot of, a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of words i say that all the time I'm like jack this has a lot of words <laughs> <laughs> um so the difference between a triple net lease and a single net lease is a triple net lease will include your rent your insurance the taxes and the maintenance and common charges of the not just the unit that you're renting but also of the entire um, building. Now it's prorated based on your percent of own, percent of what you're renting. So you're not going to pay equal share amongst the other tenants for those common charges or maintenance charges. It will be prorated based on your square footage of the unit. Um, but this is where negotiation is very important because when you are negotiating your rent, you also need to look at down the line, what are your total costs for this lease? And I do have a sample lease I can share if you would like to see it. Yeah, go for it. Let me find my screen uh -oh. share. I have a lot of screen shares. I have a lot of things over here. Let's just 
I'm going to go ahead and make you a co-host so that you can share easily. There you go. Jack, if you want to just confirm, I'm sharing the right screen. It should say taxes highlighted on the lease. Yep. Well, okay. Thank you. Because I can't see what I'm sharing. <laughs> I'm just going to scroll up to the top of the lease. So like I said, these leases have a lot of words. This is a 42 page lease. So the first step in a lease, um, which is similar to a uh, purchase agreement are letters of intent. And some of the terms of the lease get negotiated before the lease is even drafted. So your term, are you renting this for three years, five years, 10 years? How long are you leasing it for? And the rent schedule, what your percent increase is going to be. So right here, we have a fixed minimum rent box. And this is something that is at times pre-negotiated how long are you renting it for? So this is a 10 year term. What's your square footage, your per month and per year and how it increases over the course of time. This is negotiated. This is very important. Negotiate your increases. Yeah. Uh, whether it's during the letter of intent, when they do that, if the landlord is going to, to provide and draft and negotiate a letter of intent, or you're smart and you've already engaged with an attorney who can walk you through <laughs> this. Um, and then we go down to the additional rent and this is where the triple net comes in. And you have the additional rent where it says on here, with the common maintenance expenses, taxes and insurance are, very, are listed on this specific lease. The common maintenance will include at times landscaping, Garbage removal. Um, I'm trying to think of some other ones. It could be um, just cleaning of the yards, parking, taking care of the parking lot for a mixed use when there are other tenants. And again, this can also be specific to the type of commercial property that you're renting. So is it, is it a mixed use? Is it a shopping center? So that's important to keep in mind, what are those common maintenance charges going to be? And there could be com other common areas that you're sharing. There could be in an office building, a shared conference space, lobby space, and that additional rent will be negotiated and prorated into that triple net. And, and I'll say there's a couple of things associated with that and, and for negotiating, which is um, landlords will throw the kitchen sink in there and make you ask you to pay for everything. And there are ways to carve out certain things. So for example, um, you know, is it fair that, you know, you're paying a pro rata share of common area maintenance? So the total charge of everything that is thrown into this bucket. So electricity for the lights outside in the parking lot, security for the parking lot, you know, all these things um, that, that go into this bucket. But what happens when the, the one of the, the factors in that multiplication problem change, meaning that your pro rata share increases because it's based upon the least square footage or sorry, it's based on the total square footage versus the least square footage. So you have now some occupancy in the shopping center, but you're still required to pay your, you know, full share of it, uh, in which a larger share versus, you know, what kind of you're actually using. Um, another is, so uh, they throw in their administrative expenses. Well, you know, is it fair to charge you for their, um, expenses in finding or not finding a new tenant for that large space that's over there. So then it's going to, so there are things that stack upon themselves. And so it does become a kind of a push and pull. Um, you know, a lot of times when we're reviewing leases on behalf of tenants, we gut that out and we try to, you know, put as much as we can back on the landlord. Of course, when we're representing the landlord, it's, you know, Hey, these are the terms and conditions we could, um, increase your base rent. And then, you know, so we can move around numbers if you, if that makes you feel better kind of thing, you know, we're not as flippant uh, when we, when we have those negotiations, but that's really kind of the thing. So we see it on both ends on which, on which way to go, but, but yeah, you'll see some pretty intense cam uh, buckets out there. Yeah. Jack and I just had a lease where I think the tenant was obligated to pay everything. 
I mean, everything. <laughs> and wow. I, it was, uh, that was a fun one to redline. <laughs> There's more red than black by the time we were done with it. <laughs> the, hey, I, I wanna, did Michelle, check the chat because there's another follow-up there yeah. does the lease have to be formally filed with the clerk of court to ensure lease extensions are available for the lessee if the ownership of the property changes also what got use can happen when ownership of the property changes and the new owner wants to not allow the lease extension so this is the one of the terms that's in a lease is if a memo of the lease a memorandum of lease needs to be if the parties decide to file a memo of the lease and that's up to the parties when the lease is negotiated. It's not necessary. The lease terms are the lease terms, whether it's filed with the clerk or not. Um, the lease, so if you are eligible within your lease, lease terms for lease extensions, that's your right. And whether it's filed or not, it doesn't, that's irrelevant. Um, what gotchas can happen when ownership of the property changes and new ownership wants to not allow the lease extensions when new ownership, when the ownership of the property changes, and there are paragraphs in most leases that will allow for allow for this, the leases get transferred over to the new owner, and the terms of that lease will either stay the same or they there could be an addendum to the lease drawn up between the tenant and the new landlord. And the same would happen in the adverse if you are leasing the property and you want to assign your lease over to a different entity, whether it's a sister company, an affiliate of your company, or a completely different company or vendor, whomever, depending on the terms of the assignment in your lease. And there is an assignment passage in paragraph in this lease, which we can look at. So you can see what the allowance is for the lease um, assignments and such. Yeah, the, the premise of it is, is that when a purchaser of the of the property, in other words, your new landlord takes it, they take subject to all the liabilities of the seller, which is your current landlord. So they will, um, you know, a, a, inclusive of any rights of renewal. Now, you know, I would say that the biggest hurdle that tenants create for themselves is when they get frustrated with their current landlord or new landlord, they withhold rent. That you have just given the landlord a huge missile to fire at you when you do that. I know it's frustrating because you're like, well, they owe me money and you're telling me that I need to pay them money, um, which is the rent. And the answer to that is yes, there, there, uh, there is a formal way of dealing with that. And withholding rent is the worst way to deal with it because you're giving them a claim that um, is very specific in most leases that say that is a breach and the consequences mm -hmm. of breach. If you don't pay are whatever it says, and usually it's, we can kick you out if you don't pay. Uh, and so you don't want to give them that ammunition. You want to pr preserve your claim, but yeah, th so there's the, in this lease, the, the paragraph for that. Echoing that comment, um, in 2011, <laughs> I wish we would have had that conversation, Jack. Um, I'm sure that you know a friend perhaps might have uh, learned that lesson uh, the hard way in a landlord dispute, but just a friend, not anybody that you would know. Of course, or even a friend of a friend. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yep. Hence the reason we're doing this. Yeah. To this. Save friends yeah. from heaven. Said, said friend has a non disparagement clause as part of the arbitration settlement. <laughs> Otherwise, he might name said friend might name some names. <laughs> yes, those those sometimes those gag orders sometimes work. I mean, I will also say let me let me put this in the context of a franchise relationship as well. So a lot of times with our franchisees, we'll negotiate with our landlord the ability to, and sometimes the franchisors will require this that. Um, with a, a franchise or a addendum to the lease agreement where the if the franchisee, the tenant screws up, then the franchisor can come in and take over the space pursuant to the terms of the lease, but they can also assign it to a new franchisee so long as it's the same franchise system. A lot of times um, franchisees will also negotiate the similar term where they'll say, um, hey, landlord, if I 
go out of the business, but I bring you a viable new tenant that is a franchisee of the same system, then you have to let them in subject to your credit checks and everything else. But if they are a qualified candidate, then you can't tell them no. And and it's not a breach of our lease agreement to force you to essentially accept that new tenant. So again, there's just, um, if, if you take nothing else out of this, uh, other than leases are very much negotiable and they should be negotiated and they should be reviewed very carefully because there's little escape hatches for either side and it needs to be the way you want it to be, the way you expect it to be as much as you can through the negotiations. Yeah, it, it's funny too, just to share on that, you know, when they're entertaining you in the Panther suite to get you to sign the lease, um, you know, oh yeah, now we're all on the same page. When you have a dispute, it's four quarters, sir. Four quarters of the lease. <laughs> you know, like, it's like, come on. <laughs> In other words, don't ever expect it to get any better <laughs> than it was when you negotiated in the first place. <laughs> Clearly, I have a bad taste in my mouth on all landlords. <laughs> Well, that happens all the time too. It's um, well, so you have the tenant negotiating with the landlord representative and then they come back to me and said, oh, well, this is what they meant. I'm like, that's wonderful. Let's put what they meant in writing in the piece of paper. Mm -hmm. Well, we can't really do that because it's more of a gentleman, ladies and gentlemen's arrangement. I'm like, well, nope, it's it, it, that doesn't exist because exactly what you said is it in the four corners of the document. Well, nope. So their attorney's going to say, nope, not doing it. So I was going to add to that, Jack, I think a big pitfall is that oftentimes the leases are pre-negotiated before the attorneys even see them. And everybody, mm -hmm. the landlord and the tenant believe that they're on the same page. And I'm going to say this, oftentimes a landlord takes advantage of a tenant, or if they're working through a broker who's not a commercial broker used to renting commercial space, there are things that'll get passed through on the lease. And then when it does come to our desks and we're looking at them, oftentimes we're in a position where we can't negotiate certain things that really need to come out on the benefit of the tenant, or we need to expand on something or language is just not clear because the tenant believed the intent was one thing and the landlord believed the intent was something else. Landlord drafted this or landlord's counsel drafted this document. So it's important to engage as early as possible, especially when you're newer to leasing these commercial spaces. Oh, you, you mean landlords haven't gotten the memo that the tenants are their customers and they should adopt the customer friendly position like we have to at BGW and you have to at Shoemaker? I'm shocked, <laughs> madam. <laughs> now, if I were representing a landlord in this transaction, my conversation might be a little different. Uh you're getting the benefit of reduced rent for your triple net lease. <laughs> you know, Michelle, you might want to go into um, who's responsible for what yes. and talk about, okay, so in a triple net, you know, and, and then also you know, it's within the premises, outside the premises. Um, also a big one is HVAC, who's responsible for that. And, you know, if it's a new, getting the, the service contracts and those kind of things. I'm not even going to scroll through this document. I'll give everybody a headache. So triple net lease. Within a triple net lease, the landlord is generally responsible for everything outside of the unit, while the tenant is responsible for everything inside the unit. So the roof and the exterior walls are what the landlord is responsible for, where the tenant is responsible for everything inside. And that includes the HVAC. So if your HVAC goes down as the tenant, you are responsible for it. And all maintenance agreements need to be in the name of the tenant or should be in the name of the tenant and have to be available to the landlord. And the tenant generally has a certain amount of time. And that's just a couple of days to repair anything that needs to be repaired before they're in default under the lease. And then there are default provisions. That's a whole other conversation we can get into. And, and I would say also, please understand that there is a huge difference between the word repair and the word replacement. Um, a lot of times you'll see leases that say, okay, the tenant is responsible for repairing and the landlord's responsible for replacement. Well, at some point, 
you might think a repair becomes a replacement when you spend enough money, specifically with HVAC. And so um, you know, the suggestion is that on the front end, before you sign a lease, you need to know if that HVAC is going to last one month or four years, essentially. You're likely going to have to get a, a service contract on it. Um, then you should negotiate, and, and we've this has gone in various ways, but sometimes we've negotiated, well, we are responsible for repair, you're responsible for replacement. The logical response to that by a landlord should be, well, wait a minute, so if it breaks, you want me to replace it, and then you get to use it. Um, isn't it fair that you pay for the, the usage of it while you're using it? for the, the life of it. So for example, and I've cut, we've put together very sophisticated provisions, paragraphs that would say, well, if it breaks in lease year seven and it gets replaced and you have a 10 year lease, you're paying for three uh, tenths of the cost of that replacement. And then if you renew it, you're going to pay for even more of it. But, you know, so they're splitting the cost that way. So just be aware of that with the roof. Sometimes it's, well, you're going to fix leaks and uh, test tenant, but the landlord's responsible for replacement of the roof. Well, if it can be patched up a hundred times before it actually needs a replacement, then, you know, so it's just little things like that, that th those are a lot of the gotchas when you're dealing with those kind of things as well. One, an important thing to note with the triple net lease is that it is beneficial to the landlord because the landlord has limited responsibility, financial obligations, because the tenant is paying their pro rata share of their taxes, of their insurance, of the maintenance, of the repairs, like Jack was just explaining. And that's where this becomes the benefit to the landlord. And in order to make this more of a tenant benefit, the negotiation of that base rent is important because that's where you can reduce your financial obligations. So you can bring down your base rent because you know that you're going to be paying a total whole with those additional taxes, insurance, and maintenance. It's going to be a much bigger financial expense every month. Um, does anybody have any questions on that? Because I know that's that's a there's so there's so many nuances to this triple net lease with respect to this open-ended maintenance and common charges and what gets incorporated into that. And it is somewhat negotiable, our favorite word, everything is negotiable because it, it depends on, <laughs> on the lease and the type of um, unit that you're renting. If it's an office building, a mixed use, are you running a business, pet shop, you know, something like, something like that. Um, Michelle, let me add also, since we're talking about kind of like that, that wall between inside and outside the premises. Mm -hmm. So, you know, here's also something else. I, we see leases that will say, you tenant are responsible for all of your guests, your invitees, um, your employees, basically anyone who has come into your shop. And I look at those and I'm like, okay, I get it. If they're in the shop, and they do something in the shop, then, you know, okay, maybe I should be responsible for that damage. You know, they punch a hole in the wall and, and mess up the drywall. So I'm going to have to fix that as, as the tenant. However, let's say that this employee is having a bad day. She walks outside. into. So let me take a step back. The provision says um, responsible for any of your invitees, your employees, on the premises or in the common area, okay? So now you've just incorporated, not just inside the building, you've incorporated everything outside the parking lot and everything else. Upset employee walks outside, um, sees her boyfriend, they get in a fight, she wallops him, right? Okay, is that your responsibility? That's your employee. That employee did something on in the common area. Uh, you know, is that your responsibility? So, you know, um, it's those kind of things where I try to say, well, you know, if, if it's, and then also if it's, if it's our responsibility inside, it's not outside. If it's something that, um, is work related, let's say that, um, the person is leaving the parking, our employee is leaving the parking lot and demolishes a light post. Am I supposed to now pay for that repair because that's my employee kind of thing? 
And so, you know, those are the kind of things, the little, the details that make a difference and, you know, will save you or cost you thousands of dollars. And again, I'm not saying that Michelle and I are, you know, have a crystal ball and we can anticipate everything. But I mean, there's just things that we see that move the assumption. Again, remember, all a contract is, is well, much of a contract is taking that assumption of risk needle and moving it one way or another. Okay. And so we want to help you move it in the direction that favors you within reason. And so, you know, those kind of things, again, inside the building, outside, inside the premises, outside the premises that make a difference, but you read it and it's like, oh yeah, that makes sense. You know, my employees, my, my, my patrons, they do something bad and, and break something, I should fix it. But it, it means much more than that. And that, and that tacks onto the negligence portion of these provisions that are added. And when there is a tenant negligence, are they responsible for the outside? And was the employer negligent in allowing their employee to leave and hit the pole? <laughs> you know, like, what were the circumstances in which that happened? Was the tenant negligent doing repairs and they pulled, they did something and it went through the roof? And now the roof needs to be repaired in a way in which the landlord would have otherwise been responsible, but now the tenant's responsible. So really defining those terms and what they mean and how they align with you as the tenant or as the landlord and what benefits you. And I'll give you a PPS to that as well, which is that a lot of the provisions that you read, you see in a lease will say, you know, put absolute responsibility on the tenant. Um, in, in places where you think, okay, yeah, it should be tenant's responsibility. However, what if landlord did something that caused that whatever it is to happen that tenant did? Let's say that there was a big hole in the parking lot and you know they ran into something or whatever it may be. So a lot of times we try to put in except for the gross negligence or willful misconduct of the landlord or its agents or employees – then tenant is responsible. And you just see that over and over again, where it's just this absolute responsibility and the, the landlord saying basically the opposite by um, omission of language that, well, even if we screw up or have a hand in the problem because it's your, your employee or your customer, then it's totally your problem to fix it. Man, um, this, go ahead. this is good. Uh, one thing that I, I did not know, HVAC, I just would have not, because I would have said, hey, that's on the roof or wherever, right? But HVAC, like, dang. Dude, if there's a way that our landlord could save me for the parking gate, they would. So, yeah, no, that, that, I, I'm i I'm with you, Gary. And when it's like, well, but it was your, con like, I've tried all the arguments. It was your contractor that installed it. And it's like, I didn't even want that contractor. And, you know, you made me use them. And it's like, and you're the one that specified the crap ass unit. And now I. Right. That freight train left the station, baby. <laughs> I try, I try, I tried them all. Yeah. I, I'm really the worst customer that anybody could ever have. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you've got a gag order. On you. Yeah. <laughs> So I want to propose a programming note. I mean, I, I think that, you know, we were intending on talking about purchase agreements. I think we save that for another time um, simply because I don't want to rush through the remainder yeah. of the mm -hmm. lease discussion. Um, but, you know, Michelle, maybe talk about um, yeah. uh, cure periods for um, monetary defaults and non-monetary defaults and the difference between a static 12 month period and a moving 12 month period. And, you know, just kind of what, provisions could be negotiated to temper a potential default um, when something happens, you know, the tenant doesn't pay or doesn't do what they're supposed to do. So a big one is the tenant default. And what does, what is a tenant default? Is it a monetary default or is there, or is it a material default within the lease? So the tenant is supposed to pay their rent every month by the first of the month. The rent and the additional costs. <laughs> so we're talking about the base rent and that triple net amounts that were that we had discussed earlier. If they don't pay by the first of the month, are they automatically, as the tenant, are you automatically in default? And generally, no. You're not automatically in default. You're in default if you don't pay it within a couple of days. That term, those days, 
that's negotiated. Generally, it's three to five days you have to cure your, and you know, make sure you pay. In the lease, it's also negotiated. How many times can you default before, you know what, you can no longer extend your lease. You're, you're eligible within your lease to extend your lease term twice, unless you have defaulted. Is there a different material brief, material now that was, sorry, that's the rent default and monetary default, a material default, your insurance lapsed. You are supposed to maintain insurance on your property. Your insurance lapsed through error. You have to cure that within a certain period of time or the repairs we spoke about. You have to repair the leak in the bathroom, the plumbing leak. You have 10 days to fix that and have get your plumber in, have it repaired and have the landlord satisfied with the repairs, satisfied with the plumber that you're using. And if, Jack, I think what you're going with that is how does this overall affect your, your lease and down the line your lease? So monetary default, you have a few days to make sure your rent is paid before it's considered an actual default. And now you're no longer eligible for other provisions in the lease that you would have been. I'm sorry, I'm like speaking quickly. I'm looking at the time at the same time, trying to get everything. <laughs> All good, we'll <laughs> get it. Minutes. And um, the material default, so the repairs, the plumbing you generally have more time for a material def default within the lease. Everything is supposed to be within working order. Now there's a leak. You wanna make sure that that leak doesn't go to your neighboring unit and have an, cause an issue with your neighbor because, and that's why there are short, that's why you have a cure period and a default period. You're not necessarily in default if you're within your cure period, negotiated terms. So a landlord might, put, might say you have three days to fix a plumbing issue. Well, you three days is not enough time. And it's three days, not three business days. So if the if it leaks on Saturday and you're in an office building and you don't find out until Monday, you've already lost two days. So now you want to change those terms. You want to try and get business days in there so you know that it's being occupied. Define what business days are in your lease. What are your operational days? And extend that time frame out to allow yourself to get a plumber in there in this example and actually be able to fix it make sure parts can come in in time that way you are not in default so if you do need to extend your lease and i always go back to lease extensions because that's the big one that they say you are not eligible to extend your lease term if you have been in default so making sure that that stuff is taken care of within that period of time and everything is in writing yeah, and, and also uh, to the landlord. Yeah, and a, a big nuance that needs to be addressed is the difference between. So uh, here's a scenario. Well, you know, Jack, I didn't know, I didn't realize that um, I wasn't going to get noticed that if my payment's late, then they're going to tell me. And then I get the, the five days, three or five days. Um, from a landlord's perspective, and I'll just share that with you because I've had to say this to opposing counsel, which is, um, okay, so your rent is due on the fifth of every month. It doesn't change. The amount doesn't change. Um, you need to do whatever you need to do to make sure the rent gets there by the fifth. And then you have a few extra days in case somebody screwed up or there's a banking holiday, whatever there may be. But it is not reasonable for you to expect landlord to tell you every time your rent is late so no there's no cure there's no extended cure period there's no notice we're not going to send you a letter and say hey you haven't paid it's a default after the three to five days after the fifth so between the eighth and the tenth you know it's it's default versus these other material defaults that michelle's talking about it usually requires the landlord to say hey you screwed this up go fix it and then you have 30 days or whatever it may be um, so, and, and then there's the nuance of, is it upon receipt of, of the, the notice of breach or is it upon them sending it and you get into the, you know, nuances of that. So, um, again, it, it, words make a difference and timing makes a difference. And so splitting these things out, the, the lease that was up before even talks about, okay, um, failure to pay rent, um, payment is received late. So, you know, it's not necessarily a failure to pay rent. It's just that it was received late. So there's a different cure period for that. 
um, fails to perform on various uh, obligations, those kind of things. Uh, and Michelle mentioned uh, technical defaults, which is not maintaining your insurance and those kind of things. So, you know, all that is part of it. So. No, it's just important that you know what the context of your lease actually reads and what your obligations are as the tenant and making sure that you are following through with everything. So it's not just maintaining your business in a clean, safe environment, which we all want to do. There's so many more nuances and obligations as a tenant in someone else's space. So this is somebody else's space. Ultimately, it's somebody else's space. You're just borrowing it for your term. And, and I'll add one last point since we're kind of getting towards the, the end of the hour, which is that um, there usually is a provision in the lease for the landlord to come onto the property under various circumstances. One is during emergencies, and basically it is they can bust through the door if they have to, essentially. Um, secondly is when um, there is an issue that is not emergent, but it's, it is something that needs to be fixed and you are not fixing it so they can come on the premises. The third is when you're getting towards the end of your lease or you've defaulted and they are showing the, the, the property to a potential new tenant. And so you need to basically put some parameters in that situation. It should be, you know, hopefully not during business hours, but that's unlikely that a landlord will agree to that. So it should be with proper notice, written notice to you with a sufficient amount of time to know when that person is going to come, that landlord representative is going to show up at your door. And then there also should be a requirement that they don't interrupt your business, you know, and be maybe I would say kind of discreet. And so, cause you don't want to get the question, Oh, are you guys going out of business? Why, why, why are you leaving kind of thing? And it's, Maybe that you're moving to a much nicer space on the other side of the shopping center. So, you know, it's just you want them to be required to be as the least disruptive to your ordinary course of business um, if they are on your property. So I'm going to stop there. And then, you know, if anybody has any questions that that is burning on them, um, if they want to share that, but. Um, I think we're probably we're at a good stop. I mean, we could talk about this the rest of the day, but we're at a good stopping point for now. I think we covered kind of the major things. And like I said, I think that we, you know, move the discussion of purchase and sale agreements to another time because that could take up more than an hour as well. Yeah, I agree with that. We did get a last minute uh, question in here from Georgia. Uh, are you able to see that, Michelle? I, I'm reading it now. Um, I'll read it out loud. These leases double double net and triple net are industry standards as are legal and accounting practices, a way the type of customer, government, large or small business, residential, et cetera, on the terms that I negotiate. How might you suggest a landlord evaluate the terms per customer type, business valuation, et cetera? Obviously one can raise the cap rate and take on the expenses, but note that we often pay more for real estate based on the type of the lease opportunities. The lesser is a pre is as predatory as a landlord, bigger company or federal agency and can lawyer up, just saying, as a small landlord. So, mm -hmm. and that's, depending on the type of um, facility that you're renting. So is it an office building? And you know the type of tenant, there is market value that, that the leases are based off of. And as the landlord, you choose who you're gonna lease your space to. And you, so as far as negotiations, it's what you're comfortable with knowing what you're going to receive. And I mean, Jack, I don't know if you want to chime in here because you might have more experience with more of these larger and government entities and business valuations in that respect. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, gr a great point. I mean, it's part of, part of the due diligence in analyzing um, your kind of tenant base is understanding kind of the space uh, to begin with, and then understanding, yes, I mean, are, are you going to permit um, uh, a, co a company that has some higher risks in their use of the premises versus someone that's just going to be there for office space and, and pushing paper around and stuff? And there's still dangers with that. Um, and so, uh, yes, some some tenants are, are desired necessarily. Um, others, uh, in with landlords doing kind of their risk tolerance are okay with, uh, renting, leasing to 
more riskier kind of clientele. But yes, there has to should be adjustment. Whether you know in in, in your perspective, whether it's you know the the cap rate, whether it is the cam, the base rate, uh, the additional rent that um, you know the, in this lease there was a provision, or actually it was not in there, but it, it could have been for a uh, percentage rent. So it's based upon the performance of your tenant. So there's ways to recoup that investment. But yes, I mean, a, a um, reasonable and good landlord will do the assessment and decide where that, what kind of clientele they want, and then also price it properly with their internal rate of returns and everything else that's associated with um, being a landlord. I don't know if that answered the question, but um, she kind of answered the question on her own anyway. But, um, you know, it's kind of like, yeah, you there are ways to recoup that investment. And and it's, again, moving the assumption of risk needle to a certain point and then pricing where that needle lies as to how you want to um, uh, continue on with your investment as being a property owner. So we've got a yes and amen to your suggestion from David. And he says, great topic and great input. There are just too many things to discuss in an hour's time. Different property types have drastically different nuances as well. We agree. <clears throat> so I think we will have to do a, a part two and uh, get more into the ownership side, right? Yeah, let's do that. All right. That sounds good. Uh, and then stay tuned for next week. Uh, it's going to be the Adam and Gary show because we're giving Jack a little bit of time with his family. And so that'll be good. And then just as a reminder, the 200th week anniversary is the 28th. Put it on your calendar. Join us in person if you can. Uh, that will be the 28th at the Hamilton in the whole Abbott Exchange area. From 11 till noon, there will be there will be some food, and it's going to be limited to the first 100 people. So uh, we've got a pretty nice turnout already, but that is going to be fun and hopefully informative as well. So we might good. they might let us use the smoke machine this year too. Oh yeah. Oh man, you got me. You, you had me at smoke machine. <laughs> so. <laughs> drummers like smoke machines mm -hmm. <laughs> so, all right well michelle thank you so much for thank you for having me jumping into romper room with us yeah. and humoring us <laughs> I appreciate it. thank you for having me on yeah you you brought a lot of um much needed insight and some sophistication that we also need too so <laughs> thank you <laughs> yeah all you right. make you make us all look smarter so that's awesome <laughs> Ah, uh, Jack, you do that to me every day. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, we will put this up on the BGW CPA YouTube channel later on this afternoon. And Jack and his team will do the same thing on the Shoemaker YouTube channel this afternoon as well. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks again, Michelle. Have a Thank wonderful you. day. Enjoy this beautiful weather. See y'all. Bye-bye.